So I'd like to start off uh, talking to this slide, which is an image of uh, part of the Amazon basin. And this is a rather small tributary in terms of the Amazonian basin. And I put it up because I wanted just to make the point that C4 photosynthesis and C4 plants um, is a general adaptive trait which allows high, pro high productivity in many different environments. Lots of people who remember a little bit about C4 photosynthesis always say, oh, yeah, it's good for drought, dry environments, but actually it's generally adaptive. And the evidence on this slide is that this is the, the tributary, of course. This is a sward of Echinocloa polystachia, which is a C4 plant. It's the only plant which appears to be able to grow at that level just um, by the water. And it does so by growing 14 metres vertically every year to keep above the water, which is changing because of the annual precipitation cycle within the whole of the Amazonian basin. So it's an interesting um, example of how productive plants can be, and in particular how productive the C4 pathway can be. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, some of our ideas associated with how C4 photosynthesis can evolve. And there are many reasons why one might be interested in this, but uh, of relevance today is that C4 photosynthesis, many people consider to be relevant to food security. Um, and the reason for this is John Beddington showed you this morning that wheat yields have been rising steadily since the Green Revolution, but the rate of that increase has been slowing down recently. So the increases are uh, plateauing off. Those increases are still happening, about 1.5% each year for wheat and rice. And this means that every time we get an increase, every time the breeders get this 1.5% increase, we're getting closer and closer to a theoretical maximum. And if you look at see what all of the breeding has done over the last 50 years to the maximum attainable growth, the yield potential, it hasn't really changed at all. And so these data come from rice grown in the Philippines at the International Rice Research Institute. And what they've done is they've grown rice, um, completely irrigated, as much fertilizer as they need, so optimal fertilization. They've put nets up to control rats. They've sprayed the crops um, probably more often than they're meant to for uh, biosafety reasons to keep down pests and pathogens. And they're measuring, therefore, the maximum attainable yield. And over that 50, 40 to 50 year time period, the maximum yield of these crops when they're in optimal conditions has not really changed at all. So we're getting closer and closer to this, um, this theoretical maximum. So if we're going to food, f feed people in 25 years time, we need to start thinking about how we manipulate this maximum as well as maintaining and increasing these 1.5% annual improvements. The little equation on the right-hand side is a description of what controls the maximum yield. Um, so maximum grain yield for cereals is determined by the harvest index. You all know the amount of dry matter going into what we harvest, the grain. It's determined by the efficiency with which light is used and converted into dry matter, the radiation use efficiency. It's also determined by how long you grow the crop for. Uh, the amount of photosynthetic active radiation which hits the crop, and then the amount of that photosynthetically active radiation which is intercepted. So on the next slide, what I want to do is to look at how we've manipulated each of those sub-traits during the Green Revolution and since, and ask which of those have we still got left to play with. Um, so the harvest index was one of the main traits that we modified during the Green Revolution. Uh, most agronomists consider you can't do too much with that anymore. Radiation use efficiency, actually, we don't have any evidence we manipulated that significantly in the Green Revolution. The growth duration, we could modify, but if we extend it, we'd reduce the number of harvests per year. Um, so for total productivity, that's not a great thing. The amount of light incident on a crop you can change by growing the crop in a different place. As we know, we're relatively short on available land to move crops into. And the fraction of instant photosynthetically active radiation hitting the crop and being intercepted was another major factor we changed uh, during the Green Revolution because we changed the stature and we changed the leaf air index of plants. So this leaves us with radiation use efficiency and asking the question, is there variation within that in existing crops that we could use 
to raise this yield ceiling uh, in, in crops such as uh, rice and wheat. And of course there is, or I wouldn't be standing here, uh, this is a slide again from the Philippines at the International Rice Research Institute, and at the foreground you see rice, which uses C3 photosynthesis, and behind that you see actually a, a weed of rice, um, which uses C4 photosynthesis, and they were planted at the same time, and the growth enhancement that you see between the rice and the weed is due to the, the difference in the photosynthetic pathway. It's about 50% more productive. Behind that, you see corn or maize in the background. Um, you can hypothesize that the difference between the weed and the maize, which both use C4 fed synthesis, is related to domestication. Okay, so a little bit of introduction as to why C4 fed synthesis has evolved. Um, on the left-hand side, there is a little plot of proposed atmospheric concentrations of CO2 and oxygen during the, um, Earth's history, so from 4 billion to present day. And of course, in the early days, there were huge amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, almost no oxygen. And due to the success of photosynthetic organisms, they've dragged that CO2 out of the atmosphere and fixed it. And this little dip here, about 3.6 billion years ago, um, in geological time coincides quite nicely with when we have evidence, evidence for photosynthetic bacteria, which started to suck the CO2 out. So photosynthesis itself has been successful. Oxygenic photosynthesis evolved about two and a half billion years ago, and then we see the oxygen accumulating. So this creates a conundrum for the photosynthetic organisms in that initially there are huge amounts of its primary substrate in the atmosphere, the CO2, and the enzyme which evolved to fix that CO2 was happy. And it carried on fixing CO2 to make phosphoglyceric acid and then, um, should we say glucose or sucrose, Alison? <laughs> I'm joking, sucrose, carbohydrates. Um, that went on for, for millions or billions of years. But as the CO2 got sucked down, the oxygen, the oxygen um, and the oxygen accumulates in the atmosphere, Rubisco is now faced with being able to distinguish between these relatively similar gases, and it does it most of the time. It, most of the time it fixes CO2, but a proportion of the time it doesn't. And when it doesn't fix CO2 and it fixes oxygen, this leads to a compromise in photosynthetic activity because it makes phosphoglycolate a bad thing, a two-carbon compound, no net fixation of CO2, but also toxic. Uh, and you know that plants have evolved a complex system, photorespiration, to retrieve some of that CO2 from phosphoglycolate. So when that oxygenase reaction of Rubisco is operating, it's reducing the efficiency of photosynthesis, and this difference in the efficiency of the C3 rice, the C4 weed, and the C4 maize that I showed you on the previous slide, is associated with the C4 species abolishing that side of the reaction. And they do that by compartmenting, compartmentalizing photosynthesis into specific cells within the leaves in the main. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, how it works. So first of all, the C4 leaf is an extraordinarily complicated system. Um, first of all, if you take a, a generalized model of a C4 leaf, you almost always find a vein surrounded by a layer of bundle sheath cells which is then enclosed in the wreath of mesophyll cells, hence the name Kranz anatomy from the German for wreath. And then you get that, that unit repeated upon itself. So vein bundle sheath mesophyll, mesophyll bundle sheath vein. This is a dramatic change in leaf development from most C3 leaves. And superimposed upon that leaf development, you get the partitioning of photosynthesis, as I mentioned, between the two cell types, such that we get initial fixation of CO2 and bicarbonate by PEP carboxylase in the mesophyll cells to generate oxaloacetic acid and then malic acid, hence the name C4 photosynthesis. These then diffuse into the bundle sheath cells where Rubisco is restricted and a decarboxylase, C4 acid decarboxylase, releases high concentrations of CO2 around Rubisco, hence the oxygenation reaction of Rubisco is reduced. The three carbon skeleton left after that decarboxylation reaction, in this case pyruvate, diffuses back into the mesophyll cell in order to keep that C4 cycle um, running. And that's the basic uh, 
um, basics of the C4 cycle. And it's evolved um, primarily in tropical and subtropical regions, it's thought to be, and that's thought to be associated with the fact that the oxygenation reaction of Rubisco increases with temperature. So the relevance to rice in particular and wheat in some areas and food security is that rice is a C3 crop and our current understanding of its domestication is it was domesticated originally in temperate environments where C4 photosynthesis wasn't particularly advantageous, where C3 was advantageous, and that's probably why rice uses C3. But we like the taste of these crops so much, we've dragged them down into much more sub subtropical and tropical regions. And now they evolved in a temperate region where oxygenation wasn't a massive problem, but we grow huge amounts of them in subtropics and tropics where it is. So there would be um, significant advant advantage in reducing photorespiration in these crops where we're growing them in warmer climates or uh, more arid environments than they were originally domesticated in. Um, the last thing I want to say as part of an introduction is that there's all these sort of people saying, all, all these ideas that um, understanding C4 is important for food security. Actually, if you're a biologist, it's interesting for another reason, uh, maybe slightly more esoteric, but it's one of the most remarkable examples of convergent evolution that we know about, at least I know about, and the evidence for this is superimposed on um, one of the cladograms for the angiosperm phylogeny group, and you see the major groups there, and each of those arrows represents a clade in which we know C4 photosynthesis um, is found. And those are broken down into families on the right, so up here there are three families which contain C4 plants, etc., etc. But within each of those families, there are often multiple independent C4 lineages. And the current estimate is that this complicated system which involves changes in leaf anatomy and cell biology and biochemistry, has evolved 66 times independently. We would like to understand how it might have done that. Okay, so some of the things that we're doing in my lab include, uh, we're involved in a large international consortium which is trying to test the feasibility of placing the C4 pathway into crops such as rice, which as you can see is ex extremely difficult we estimate it will be at least 20 years if we do it because we need to understand so much of the basic biology before it's going to happen. We're also interested in protein networks. So the, the proteins that are involved in the C4 photosynthetic pathway, what they do actually in the C3 ancestors. Uh, I think this is important if we are going to avoid lots of pleiotropic effects when we engineer C4 into C3 crops. Uh, but what I want to talk about very briefly today are two things that we've done more recently. First of all, global analysis of gene expression in C4 leaves. There's one very simple question which we wanted to address. And the second is mechanisms underlying these differences in gene expression and how they're generated. So the simplest question is, to what extent does gene expression differ between a C3 and a C4 leaf. I've told you that the systems are extremely complicated, but of course it was very difficult to define how different gene expression was uh, because the tools weren't available until a few years ago. So we carried out um, high throughput sequencing on closely related C3 and C4 species, the mature leaves of C3 plant and a C4 plant. Um, we assembled the sequences de novo, got about 14,000 genes for each leaf, and we estimated the number of transcripts were differentially abundant between those C3 and C4 leaves, and we came up with an estimate which is probably entirely wrong, almost certainly a simplification, but it's 600 odd genes, about 3% of the total. This is significantly less than some of the traits that you work on, like the circadian clock. Where's Alex? Um, okay, so it's a significant number of genes, but actually it's not as many as I think a lot of people would have expected, given that the differences in photosynthetic me metabolism are so extreme. It also, that analysis um, supported everything we knew about the C4 cycle. It also pulled out some new candidates for elements we knew existed from 
um, physiology and biochemistry, but for which there were no genes. For example, the pyruvate transporter, which Tsuyoshi Furumoto published uh, earlier this year in Nature. The other interesting thing we found, rather unexpected, is that when we look at RNAs encoding ribosomal proteins, they were massively downregulated in the C4 leaf. I think this is a, a part of the, the C4 system which had never been described. No one had ever thought about it before, and we only get it from this unbiased um, deep sequencing approach. So we did this uh, a couple of years ago now with Andreas Weber's lab in Dusseldorf, and what we're at the moment trying to tackle is the same sort of data, but from 13 independent lineages of C4 plants um, staggered across the... the um, Angiosperm, angiosperm phylogeny. So each of these groups here, we've chosen a C3 and a C4 species from the same genus. We've run the sequencing and we're interrogating the data. And the simplest question for us is, how convergent is this C4 photosynthetic system? It's evolved 66 times, we think. How convergent is it within each of those, those um, events? And in terms of engineering C4, into a C3 crop such as rice. I think knowing the, the basics of the system is fairly fundamental. So that gives you some idea of the extent to which gene expression changes in these leaves when you're running a functional C4 leaf. What I want to do now is talk about some uh, rather reductionist work we've done trying to identify the mechanisms which allow these changes in gene expression to occur. So how are these differences in gene expression generated? And really, it's how these differences um, relating to the cell specificity are generated in the C4 leaf, because this is absolutely fundamental. So compartmenting photosynthesis into the mesophyll and the bundle sheath cells in the C4 leaf is one of the key things we need to understand. Um, the background to this is that I guess 25 to 30 years of work had failed to identify a single gene um, or more, sorry, more than one gene which was regulated by the same mechanism in any C4 plant. This is a little bit difficult to square with the data that it's evolved so many times. It's also difficult to square with the fact that you have large numbers of genes changing their expression patterns. So, um, for example, there's a cis element located in this promoter, the maize PPDK promoter, about 12 nucleotides long. It's known to generate mesophyll specificity, but that has never been localized in any other gene which generates mesophyll specificity in any other C4 plant. So I just want to tell you two brief stories. The first is about two genes, NAD malic enzyme 1 and NAD malic enzyme 2, which you will remember, are encode a decarboxylase protein which release, releases CO2 in, in the bundle sheath cells around Rubisco. And these are two in situ localizations for each of those genes. This is NAD malic enzyme 1. This is NAD malic enzyme 2. And you're looking at a cross section of the leaf. And the presence of the purple color represents RNA from each of those genes. They're both expressed preferentially in the bundle sheath. These, are, these two genes form a functional heterodimer. The protein is a functional heterodimer. And we thought by choosing these, we increased our chances of finding elements which were shared by these genes in generating the bundle sheath specificity. Now what you're looking at is an image of the C4 leaf, Cleome gynandra, and the intact gene for NAD malic enzyme 1, including the promoter exons, introns, have been translationally fused to the reporter gene, Gus. And you're looking down at that leaf and this is the reticulate pattern, which is characteristic of a dicot. So that reporter is saying this protein is accumulating in the bundle sheath. It's mirroring the in situ localization. On the right hand side, there is a control where we're using the um, viral promoter, the 35S promoter, which generates expression both in mesophyll and bundle sheath cells. And you can no longer see the reticulate pattern. OK, so that's our starting point. And the end point, almost, is that within those, there's about 6,000 6, nucleotides in that sequence we started with. 
we narrowed it down to elements which are required for that bundle sheet specificity to being within 240 base pairs of the coding region of NAD malic enzyme 1 at the 5 prime end and 240 base pairs in the other NAD malic enzyme gene. They're actually in the same region of both genes and they're both in the coding sequence. Um, so we know a little bit more about this because we enjoy navel gazing. This is a 30 live S promoter control. There's a quantitative analysis saying that that gives you about 50-50 mesophyll bundle sheath cells when you shoot it into our C4 leaf. If we make an antisense construct of that 240 base pair, so we maintain the DNA sequence, but we would generate an antisense RNA con uh, sequence, antisense RNA, we still maintain specificity, so that indicates it's likely to be DNA-based, this mechanism. And then within the 240 base pairs, we now know that there are two sequences, one of seven and one of six nucleotides, which are important for this specificity, and that's been done by a series of three prime and five prime uh, deletions. So we've gone from 6,000 base pairs down to just over 10 in, to, in understanding what's determining this cell specificity in the C4 leaf. And we've also shown that, that those same elements are working in two different genes. When we look at that region, that 240 base pair region, it's in the coding sequence. It's therefore highly conserved in disparate species. And this is part of a lineup between our C4 model, Cleomy gynandra, and another C4 plant, uh, maize, NADP malic enzyme. And you can see there is identity in that sequence. And so the next experiment was to test whether our Cleomy sequence would be recognized in maize and generate bundle sheath specificity in maize, even though they're phylogenetically extremely distant. And they d it does, so we can shoot that 240 base pairs from Cleome um, into maize, and we see the maize bundle sheath cells um, lighting up with GUS. This is the quantification of this. And just to put that into context, maize, of course, is up here, and uh, Cleome is down there. The extension of that is that all of those two C4 species are linked by tens of thousands of other C3 species which are more basal in the relationship, in the phylogenetic relationship. And so if we include an Arabidopsis gene, C3 Arabidopsis gene in that lineup, we also see regions of identity and similarity through, through this region. So what happens if we test whether the Arabidopsis gene, when placed in the C4 leaf, what happens if we test whether it generates bundle sheath specificity? we get bundle sheath specificity. So this is the Arabidopsis uh, intact gene linked to Gus, and you're looking down at the Cleome C4 leaf, and you see the reticulate pattern. So the C3 gene from Arabidopsis has the information in it, which is sufficient to generate cell specificity as soon as it gets into the C4 environment. We can then propose a little bit more about the evolution of these genes, because We've also worked on the regulation of the genes in Arabidopsis, the C3 Arabidopsis. In Arabidopsis, the intact gene marks out the entire rosette. This is NAD malic enzyme 1 and NAD malic enzyme 2. You can see it's slightly higher in the uh, meristem and the midribs, but within the leaf, it marks both the venal cells, the bundle sheath, and the mesophyll cells, so it's relatively constitutive. And the regions within that gene which are responsible for that constitutive accumulation in the mesophyll and the bundle sheath cells are within the promoter of each of those genes. So here the promoter of NAD malic enzyme 1 linked to GUS on its own generates the same patterns which we saw with the intact gene. And it's the same for NAD malic enzyme 2. So this leads us to a, um, a provocative evolutionary hypothesis about the recruitment of this gene family. And it starts with the uh, angiosperm phylogeny, and it starts with analysis of a plant in the Brassicales and with rice and maize up in the Poales. And what we're proposing from this limited data set is that 
all species in all part of that phylogeny are likely contain this cis element, which in a C3 plant doesn't do very much that we know about, but in a C4 plant is able to generate bundle sheath specificity. And we think, so it's sitting here in all of those genes in the coding region and in the C4 setting in two independent lineages, a negative regulator comes in to recognize that cis element and destroy um, or uh, inhibit expression in the mesophyll cells. Um, if this hypothesis is correct, then it dates that the, the last common ancestor having that cis element would date back, depending on who you believe, between about 120 and 200 million years ago, whenever the monocots and dicots diverged. So that's, it's quite a nice example which shows for the first time that genes which are recruited into C4 photosynthesis are regulated by, likely by the same mechanism. It was, at the time it was a one-off and I said we kept the bar low by cho choosing a, multi, uh, a small multi-gene family. We've extended it more recently because we were interested in determining how general this phenomenon was. So how commonly are genes which are recruited into the C4 pathway regulated by similar mechanisms. And I now want to move from the bundle sheath cells into the mesophyll cells and talk, tell you about two carbonic anhydrases, which sit there, and PPDK, which sits here, rephosphorylating pyruvate in the chloroplast. And the figures on the right show you that the, gynan the Cleome gynandra five prime untranslated regions of the RNA are sufficient to give you mesophyll specificity for CA4. So this is the five prime UTR, this is the three prime UTR. Both of them alone are sufficient to generate mesophyll specificity. For carbonic anhydrase two, it um, transpires that something in the three prime untranslated region of that gene, which is sufficient for, me for mesophyll specificity, it's not, there isn't anything in the five prime region. Um, now, have to miss a huge amount of data out, but from a large number of deletion analyses on these untranslated regions and also some computational prediction, Ben in my lab came up with his favorite nine nucleotides and he mutated them. And these nine nucleotides are necessary for this mesophyll pre preferential accumulation in the mesophyll. So here we have our 35S GUS control giving you about 50% mesophyll bundle sheath cells. Here is our five prime untranslated region on its own, biasing expression to the mesophyll. And when we mutate only five nucleotides within that nine nucleotide region, we go back to very close to control uh, amounts of expression. So this could also be described as navel gazing. Um, there's an interesting thing, though, that we've discovered. Well, we think it's interesting. Um, that sequence looked as though it was accessible when you do RNA folding um, analysis. When you put that untranslated region into RNA fold and unifold, it looked like it was accessible. So Ben changed the structure of the untranslated region to try and ensure that those nine nucleotides were bound up and therefore less accessible to any trans factor. And so here we have our endogenous, uh, the prediction of the folding of our endogenous 5' prime UTR with accessible nucleotides, our altered one, where we have exactly the same nine nucleotide sequence we know is necessary for mesophyll specificity, but it's less likely to be accessible. And here are the quantitation of the results when we assess what this does to expression. 35S control, 50-50. The endogenous 5' prime UTR gives us mesophyll preferential expression. When we tie up those nine nucleotides in this altered, with, proposed with this RNA structure being altered, we lose our accumulation in the mesophyll cells or preferential accumulation in the mesophyll cells. That is all about one single untranslated region, and it defines, I think, an interesting mechanism for regulation of gene expression in a C4 leaf, not being based on nucleotide sequence, but being based on nucleotide sequence combined with structure of the RNA. Um, but 
The important thing to bring it back to understanding the evolution of this system is that because we've now defined that small area of sequence, we can look for it in the other untranslated regions and other genes which we know get recruited into the C4 pathway. And here we've got a load of data, um, but the key thing is that each of these upper histograms, tall histograms, is an endogenous untranslated region giving you preferential accumulation in mesophyll cells. Each time we mutate those nine nucleotides, we lose that mesophyll expression. So this tells us in at least, well, there are five untranslated regions on that slide. In all of those five untranslated regions, we're likely using the same mechanism for expression, control of expression. Last slide, Alison, you'll be glad to hear. Well, last but one slide. Um, untranslated regions classically are not as highly conserved as coding sequence in genes for obvious reasons. However, when we looked in the genes in Arabidopsis, in C3 Arabidopsis, we can detect that nine nucleotide sequence. And when those sequences are, the Arabidopsis sequences are shot into Cleome and we test them for mesophyll specificity, they give us the same thing as the C4 Cleome gynandra untranslated regions. This is the case for both five prime and three prime for CA4. It's the case for the three prime untranslated region for CA2. It's also the case for PPDK, the other gene I mentioned. So what can we take from this? We can take a few, or we can propose a few hypotheses about what may have facilitated this remarkable evolutionary or remarkable evolutionary events associated with the C4 system. First of all, we do now know that multiple genes are regulated by um, either the same or remarkably similar mechanisms. Uh, that firstly comes from the NAD malic enzyme genes, but then the CAs and the PPDKs. We know that cis elements that determine this cell specificity are actually present in the C3 genes, in the orthologs of the C4 genes. Um, and maybe this, they're sitting there and they're latent in the C3 leaf. They become recruited in to allow cell specific expression in the C4 leaf. Um, we have one example where we have a cis element giving cell specificity, which is in the coding region. Maybe that's the reason it's so ancient, because it's conserved. We have another cis element which we believe is influenced by um, RNA folding, which in the C4 world is a new thing. And uh, to go right back to the start, the transcriptomics of the closely related C3 and C4 species I think is quite powerful in detecting how different gene expression really is within these leaves. I need to thank two people who've left the lab, Naomi and Kaiser, for doing lots of the NAD and PPDK work, and two people who are in the lab, Even and Ben, who are doing the carbonic anhydrase work, and Andreas, his lab for the deep sequencing, and you for listening. Richard Summers again from uh, RHET Seeds. Um, can you make any comment about, you, you talked about the, the, the uh, tropics to more temperate and, and higher latitudes and, and the evolutionary significance of C3 and C4 there. Obviously working in Europe and, 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 and higher tropics, I'm interested in the chance of having genes or, or processes that can help our productivity in those latitudes. Is there scope, you think, for C4 with this temperature issue? to be significant? Obviously, we've moved maize further north, but uh, what do you think do you about mean, C4? Is it likely to move away from the... From we, the we talk quite glibly when we talk about productivity and the need to drive our, our, the, our varietal improvement of the C4 photosynthetic pathway being the holy grail that would help us. I worry, as you were suggesting, with the evolutionary significance, why it's not developed in the higher latitudes. So is it going to be a, a route that will help us in the UK or Scandinavia, for example, or will we have to accept it'll be a C4-based crop because of the temperature gradients between the winter and uh, summer? I, it, I don't think it is the answer to everything, uh, is the first point. It's actually, uh, if you look at what it does, it improves photosynthetic efficiency, but it also <laughs> reduces the amount of nitrogen input per photosynthetic gain. So there's a nitrogen use efficiency at the leaf level, and there is also a water use efficiency at the leaf level because the stomata uh, can be maintained 
uh, in a more closed fashion. So there are multiple reasons that it's a good thing. I don't know. I, I mean, it depends on the extent to which, well, how fast climate change happens, how, how far up it, for the northern hemisphere it will be advantageous for a C4 rice to grow. And it will, it will change with time. So I, I don't really have a great answer for it. I, don't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be areas of temperate world where a C4 wheat or a C4 rice won't necessarily be the right thing. But if you look at current distribution of rice and, and quite a lot of wheat, it would be a good thing. So I, I can't predict when it would be a good thing in parts of Europe, for example. <laughs> 